I want to tell you what a privilege that it is to be here today and to be in your presence and have this opportunity to speak to you about such an important topic. And I want you to know that I didn't get this gig by being Ty's favorite son-in-law. You know, I'm, I'm the son-in-law that took his daughter far, far away. And, uh, but I do have a story to tell you today. And I'll tell you what, uh, appreciate you being here, and I hope this uh, effort this weekend uh, will edify you and that we can all be more godly fathers. Uh, I really didn't want to take this role, uh, to be honest with you, because I thought to myself, what do I know about being a godly father? And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. It's somewhat similar to Mike's. Uh, when I was born, six months after I was born, uh, my father signed away his parental rights to me. He had other things that he wanted to do. And uh, the story doesn't end there with him. Four days after my 18th birthday, I met my biological father. And we somewhat had a honeymoon, and we spent time together, and uh, my biological father encouraged me to drink, and we were party buddies, and he lived in Kentucky, and before I would come home from the weekends, he would always buy me a carton of cigarettes to go home with, and uh, that's the kind of man that, that he was. Today, I haven't seen him for years. He's a, a meth addict on the streets of Bowling Green, Kentucky. The last time I heard from him was through a text that he told me that he's sorry that we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, and what was happening, he was... Uh, thinking he was going to die by the police shooting him uh, in a shootout uh, because of his convictions. So I never had an example in my biological father. I did have a man that was present in our home uh, that helped provide for me as a young man most of my life, but he wasn't a godly man either. He was a man that followed after lust and, and after women and the sins of that nature. So what do I know about being a godly man? Ada Pearl turned three years old in May. Sutton will turn two months tomorrow. I don't have a lot of experience of being a godly man, a godly father. But I'll tell you what I do know. I believe in God's word and its power and its instruction for leadership, uh, both in the church and in the home and the power that it gives us and the truth that it teaches us that God would give me information and you information that we would be the best godly father, godly man, leader that we can possibly be. I believe in that. And I believe in the examples that I've had uh, throughout my tenure in the church and the blessings that's come from that. I think about people in my life that have made that impact, have kind of been my godly father, if you will. Uh, men like Mark Parkhurst back home who, who sat me down and taught me the scriptures in and, and, and 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, uh, you know, commit thou to faithful men that they may teach others also. I am a product of Brother Mark's labor. I want to tell you that today. I want to tell you about Sean Zebok. Sean Zebok met me early on when I was, was dating Amy. And, and for some reason, Sean took a liking to me and took me around places and, and taught me and, and, and found interest in me. And for that, I didn't deserve, but for that, I'm grateful. And it, it gave me a zeal for being more evangelistic. And, and I want to thank so many other people like Ty Fleming, my father-in-law. I couldn't have asked for a better father-in-law to, to help guide me in this journey. So today, I preach to you not from my own power or experience of being a godly father, but I'll tell you through the Scripture and through men that have shown me the way is the only way that I can express to you the message that we have today. I believe fathers are to be the elders of the home, and, and you know that uh, that role that elders have in the church of leadership and what that means. I want to tell you, the Bible says, you've heard this scripture already this morning, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. I want to tell you today that with everything in me, I want my children to go to heaven. More than my next breath, I want my children to be in heaven. That's all I want. If I could accomplish that, brethren, I have found success. And I believe God will be pleased from that. What I do is not within me and not within my own capabilities, but what I can do for the Lord and the instruction that He's given me, that He's given me this great gift, and what I can do with that great gift that He's given. And God help us if we fail our children. God help us if we continue on uh, lazy ways and selfish ways to please ourselves and serve ourselves, and we 
lead our children to destruction as well. You know, the Bible is clear about the qualifications of an elder. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And maybe here is the definition of a godly father, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. You know, it's been said in, in our circles, and I sit in meetings and listen to men talk about the problem that we have with eldership in the church, and that only, I don't know, 20-some-odd percent of the churches represented here today actually have elders in leadership as God has commanded His kingdom to be in. Brethren, I, I submit to you today that maybe we don't have an elder problem in the church. Maybe we have a father problem. Maybe we have fathers that aren't stepping up to the responsibility and the role that He has for us. And therefore, if we're not being godly men, godly fathers, we're not doing those things that He's called us to do. We're not being the men, the example that He's shown forth in His congregation. Maybe we're not doing that and maybe we're not qualified to be elders. And therefore, our churches struggle in many ways because they have no leadership. Maybe we ought to consider that today. But I want you to think about... The elders of the home. Now, if you know Ty Fleming, he's not a big fan of pictures in PowerPoint presentations. And I want to tell you that if I worried about everything Ty Fleming thought about, I wouldn't have married his daughter. <laughs> so I've got pictures in my PowerPoint presentation. I want you to imagine here's a John Deere Model D tractor, uh, one of the earliest tractors, maybe the first tractor that John Deere ever came out with. And this little John Deere tractor, it's not much. You can see it's got steel wheels. It's got about a 25 horsepower engine. It's got a pretty uncomfortable seat that right on the back of it that you'd have to ride on. Um, but let's imagine today using this illustration that this is the example that God had set forth and said, get set forth and said, this is what I want fathers to be. You know, it's not really fancy, but this is what gets the job done. Let's imagine that. And you know, from the speeches, I appreciate Brother Timothy and Brother Mike this morning, all they've had to say. And you know, the world has a different concept of what a father ought to be and the priorities that you ought to have as a father for your children, for your home. And I'll tell you what, that has creeped into so many of us. And we've taken the role of a father and we've made it look like something else. This is a 9620RX track tractor, 620 horsepower. It's got all the bells and whistles. But is that what God wants? You know, God set a standard of what He wanted. He said, I want this. This is what's going to work. This is what's going to get the job done. And yet man has taken that and said, oh, no, no, no. We can do it better than God. We know more than God. Isn't that what the devil tries to tell us? Oh, I'll tell you what, you just follow me. And I'll give you direction and leadership. And that's not the case, brethren. I want you to consider that you as fathers, us as fathers, we have to lead by example. I want you to consider right here, this is the, the track unit on that tractor right there. Far different from a steel wheel. We need to be the pattern that our young people, our children can look up to and that they can follow a sure and steadfast way. Steadfast way. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which goeth therein. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be there that find it. I want to tell you in this world that we live in, and the things our children see, we take, for example, social media, and how many people are using that to interact. There are lots of patterns and lots of examples that our children have an opportunity to go and follow after. I'll tell you, me personally, I could care less if my daughter ever knew the name of Miley Cyrus. I don't have any desire for my daughter to follow after a pattern such as that. And we can think of example after example of ungodly people out there in the world that are vying for the attention of our children. 
And I'll tell you what, if we don't watch the screen time and if we don't watch what they're doing and who they're talking to and what they're talking about, they'll fall into that trap and they'll find an example to follow. And it may not be the example that God would be pleased with or that we would be pleased with as parents. But I'll tell you what, we can be that narrow way, that straight example that we can show our children, listen, this is the way we have to go. This is the direction we're going. This is the only way that leads to life and godliness. If we leave our children to their own ambitions, they're going to go in several different directions, and those directions don't lead to God. They lead to selfishness. They lead to worldliness. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, 6, this has been used today, train up a child the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I told you before I didn't have an example to follow. I don't have an example. I wish I did. And I'm going to tell you that Mike talked about the scars that are left from a child that does not have a godly father. Those scars are real. And oftentimes I think about in my life, I just wish I had somebody to tell me what to do here. I wish I had some example of how this is done, but I don't have that oftentimes. You know, I've, I've been in the auction business for about 12 years. I enjoy that. And I had a man, he, he's not been a, a godly father per se, but he's been a man that has trained me and taught me in the auction equipment business, especially the equipment auction business. His name's Joel Morrell. He's from Hooper, Nebraska. You and I would say Hooper, but he says Hooper, so I'm going to respect him by calling it by Hooper. Uh, and Joel had this three-day training method, and what he would do, he would come down to wherever I was at, and the first day we would ride together, he would do all the talking. And he would show me the example of what we need to do when we call on customers and how we need to talk to them and the programs that we have to offer. The second day, he would let me do about half the talking. He'd let me interject and to throw in my two cents every once in a while. But the third day, it was all me. He said, it's sink or swim time, boy. You're going you're gonna to go after this. And I tell you what, it was great training. Joel was a great leader. He was a great leader so much that I followed him to three different companies. I thought so much of the man. And that's what we ought to be doing with our children. We ought to be taking time with them and saying, listen, this is how you do it. Let me show you the example of how that you ought to do this. This is the way that works best. And then as they see that and they grow, of course, three days uh, as opposed to a lifetime uh, or the adolescence of a child, we, they need to be taking part in that. We need to be giving our children opportunity to fulfill those things that we've shown them, not just to set and be the example, but to give them opportunity to work and to use the talents that God has given them. And then there'll be a time that we can sit back and we can let them do what we've shown them to do, and we can watch them be successful as they've grown into the people that God's called them to be and given the talents and utilize those talents that God has given them, brethren. If we don't do this, they'll find another example to follow. They'll find another work to do. And brethren, it's you and I. It's up to you and I to set that standard and that expectation in our homes of what our children ought to do. You know, we need to feed our, our children spiritually. We need to give them things that's going to last, things that are eternal. You know, here's the, the cab of a tractor right here now. Van Miller probably could tell you a lot more about this than I could. But here's the cab of one of those big tractors right there. And you look at that and you see what it has. Uh, man, it's got that buddy seat there beside it. It's got that control screen that, that'll do a lot of things for you, tell you a lot of things. And then you've got this little guy right here. Well, it's that second screen. Can't get the, there you go, that's what it is. Still can't get it. That's okay. It's got that screen there. It's called auto steering. You can do a lap around a field and you can take and you can sit in that tractor and it'll just go where it wants to go and it'll plant those rows the way it ought to. And I'll tell you what, a lot of times you and I as fathers, we get into that lull uh, that we're not doing the things that we ought to do, that we, we take our children to church and we let them sit in the seat beside us and we, we dress them up in nice clothes. But are we really feeding our children spiritually? Are we really putting it in front of them and letting them be hungry? Or are we turning them into this? Do you know what this is? This is the pew potato. It's first cousins to the couch potato. You've probably heard of him. Just pew potatoes. Yes, son. I, yes, daughter. I'm going to come and I'm going to sit you on the pew and I'm going to let you hear men get up and speak. But what are we doing 
outside the walls of the church building? Are we really feeding our children spiritually or are we just trying to play this game like I'm going to feed my children spiritually when everybody is watching? I want to tell you what. The Bible's told in Acts chapter 20, Paul tells the the church, the, the elders there at Ephesus, he gives them this instruction. He says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his, with his own blood. Before Paul tells them this, he, he says this. He says, Listen, brethren, I've given you everything I know to give you. I've held nothing back that I thought was profitable to you. He said, I've taught you publicly. I've taught you from house to house. I've given you everything I have so that you may in turn go out and feed the church of God. I've given you that. I tell you what, fathers, that is our responsibility and our role as fathers is to do the very same thing, to feed our children, to give them something, uh, not just earthly meals, but something that lasts. Deuteronomy chapter 31, the Bible says in verse 11, When all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing, gather the people together, men and women and the children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, that they may learn and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land with you, go over to possess it. You know, it's funny to me, I lived, I grew up in a different kind of church. I grew up in a church that they had Sunday school, and we, we separated but by age and, and by boys and by girls. And I'll tell you what, I think it's important, friend, we just put our children in front of the Word of God. I appreciate mutual edification, the opportunity to be gathered in one place, and I appreciate that now more than ever because I want my children in the, in the presence of God's Word. Even though Ada Pearl and, and Sutton don't know anything yet, I want them to be in the presence of the Word of God because someday they're going to be hearing that Word and they're going to be taking it in and it's going to be beneficial for them. I need to just put them in front of the Word, brethren. The Bible says, Brother Miles Crouch is here today, and he showed me this last year, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1 and 2, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. He said, you know what? There's this little tender herb out there. We live in the nursery capital of the world. We know all about growing trees and plants. There's this little herb out there, and so, you know, when the rain comes, it doesn't get much rain. It doesn't take in a lot of rain. But you know what? That little tender herb takes in everything that it's capable of taking in. Our children are the exact same way. Our children are young and precious and tender. And when we give them the Word of God, they take in just as much as they can possibly take in. But as we keep feeding them and nurturing them, they grow up and, and the bigger they get, the more they absorb and the more they take in. And, and the older they get, they, they get to be like that mighty oak tree, and they take in a lot. And they are able to do much, and they grow strong in that word. But brethren, what happens when you don't water something? There's a lot of folks from Oklahoma and Texas in here. You know what it's like to have a drought on a cotton field. It's worthless. It withers away. It's good for nothing. Brethren, our children are that tender herb. If you don't water them, if you don't feed them, they'll die. They'll die just like that flower that you plant in your yard and fail to, fail to water in a drought. It'll die. The Bible says very specifically and very plainly in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. I want you to think about this passage. Before he deals with this, this topic here, he talks to the children. He wants to give the children instructions. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And then after he finishes talking to the children, he looks straight at the fathers and he says this. And you fathers, who's he talking to? He's talking to you and I, fathers. He's talking to you and I today, fathers. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, you've heard that scripture this morning taught, and I want to talk about it a little bit more. That word nurture there does not mean to coddle. It does not need to, to pet, say everything's going to be okay. It means discipline. 
It means tutelage and education, disciplinary correction, chastening, instruction, which aims to increase virtue, cultivation of the soul by correcting mistakes and curbing passions. Our children have to be led and they have to be fed. They have to be given direction lest they fall into some other path that leads to destruction. They need to be nurtured. They need to be cared for. I tell you what, we grow a big garden at our house and there's a lot of work that comes in to grow in a garden. There's a lot of things that have to be done. And if we fail to do those, we fail to reap the benefits afterward. And it's a lot of waste of time and money. Our children are the same way. If we fail to take time and to nurture those things as a plant that we're trying to get to, to, to produce good fruit, if we fail to put the time in and the effort and the heartache and whatever it takes to raise a child, if we fail to do that, we fail to produce something that will produce good fruit in the future. Is that the expectation that you want for your children, brethren, that they grow up and that they fail and that they don't produce good fruit? Not me, brethren. And I don't think that's the case for you either. The admonition we need to call attention to and rebuke and warn and exhort our children for the warning and the dangers that are out there in their life, the things that could happen to them if they fail to heed God's call. And Mike did a great job of that talking, and Timothy as well, talking about those things that happen to children when they don't have that fatherly influence. Remember, brethren, he's talking to the fathers. He's calling you out today that you are to nurture and that you are to warn your children about the, the, the harmfulness, but also about the joys that come from being a child of God. This is your responsibility. I'll tell you something. We've heard this scripture this morning again. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the word our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Brethren, let's be clear. Our job is to teach these children. If you fail and I fail to teach these children, somebody else will. It doesn't matter what kind of home a child is in, somebody is going to teach that child something from somewhere. And you know what happens to a child or anybody that's taught? They wind up believing something. Everyone believes something. And brethren, it's our job to control that message, to control that narrative to our children. I want to be the one teaching my children. I want that responsibility. I know what's best for them. Nobody loves them like I do. I want to be in charge of giving my children that message. And I want to show them what to believe in. I want to show them words of life. I don't want to show them a daddy that wants to have a good time, that wants to take them out drinking on the lake. I don't want to put things in my children's life that are addictive and that cause them problems and problems with addiction the rest of their life. I want to give them life. I want to give them words of life. I want them to grow up, and I want to be far greater than I ever thought that I could be myself. I want to give my children the daddy that I didn't have. Those scars are real, brethren, when you grow up without a godly father. I can count on one hand the times in my childhood that we opened up the Word of God in our home. I'm going to tell you, you're looking at a man who deals with those scars. You know what? It's hard for me to open up that Bible. It's a lot harder than it ought to be. But when you're never raised in it, that's all you know. Don't do that to your children. Don't give them those scars. Set, it, set things in front of them that they can take and that they can use, and that they'll be trained up in that will apply through the rest of their life. Make it habit. Make it something that you do as a family. Don't expect them to go out on their own and to get that without some guidance. Maybe they will. Maybe somebody good will step up when you're not the father you ought to be, and maybe somebody will give them some direction, but maybe not. As a father, I don't want to take that chance. I think they're worth more than that. I think they deserve the very best. 
And brethren, we have a personal responsibility to protect these children. It's my job. Now there's a big tractor there. It's got about a 48-row planter on the back of it. You know, a lot of fathers in, the, in their minds, they want to be a good father, a good father. They say, you know what, I'm going to get out and I'm just going to work, 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 and I'm going to take care of my children. I'm going to provide for them that way. And they become absent fathers. My second father I told you about, he enjoyed working. And we enjoyed working. And we worked a lot. There was a time we worked 42 hours straight and never stopped. We knew all about working hard. What happens, brethren? John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd who know my sheep and have known of mine as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus Christ talking about his church, he says, you know what, nobody cares for these sheep the way I do. I'm the shepherd, these are my sheep, and I feel a personal responsibility to look after these sheep, and nobody else can take that place. The elders of the church, they look at that flock and they say, these are the sheep of God, these are my sheep and my responsibility to look after and to protect. Nobody can take this responsibility. Nobody cares as much as I do for these sheep because these are my sheep. As a father... I look at my children and I say, no one can protect these children like I can. I can hire babysitters and pay them by the hour, but you know at the end of the day, those babysitters are hirelings. They can't care for my children the way I do because they're not their children, they're mine. Back home we have this terrible epidemic. There's two qualifications for elders there. You have to be old and people have to like you. That's not funny. They hire preachers. They let them do the feeding. I can speak for experience. I'm not here to run anybody down, but I've been in churches with elders that could not, were incapable of standing before the flock and presenting a gospel lesson. And those churches I have seen fracture. I think all of them that I've seen in that condition have fractured. Why? Because the shepherd, he wasn't minding the sheep. When trouble came, the hireling, the one that was hired to stand there and feed the flock, he ran off. Why? Because they're not his sheep. You know what's going to happen to our children if we're not present? They're going to run off because we didn't care enough about being there. Because nobody can care for my children and your children the way we can as parents. Nobody can take that place. Nobody. Well, you know, it's important to work, isn't it? We want to provide for our families. We want to be good moms and dads and provide for our children. Surely. The Bible says in a story in Elisha's day in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18, And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. He went out to the field that his father was working in. And he said to his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, he said to somebody else, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him, he brought him to his mother and sat on her, and he sat on her knees till nude and then died. A man was out working, I'm sure trying to do the best he could, wanting to do the best for his family, wanting to be a good provider for his family. And his son came to him in a time of need, said, my head, my head, it hurts. He said, hey, you, Take this boy to his mother. I'm too busy. I've got other things that I need to do. I've got other priorities as a father that I need to be tending to. Take him to his mother. You know, I had a man that I worked for one time, and we were out working on this job, and he said, do you think that God will have mercy and compassion for me because I work seven days a week, and I do that for the betterment of my family? And you know the answer that we gave. Are you really providing for your children? 
What are you giving them? I'll tell you that man's situation. He had three daughters. One of them was wild as a buck when she was younger, but she finally got something right. She went to law school and made a pretty good lawyer. The second daughter he had, she's in jail today. And the third daughter, there's no telling where she's at. He'd been absent from his home. He'd been working, trying to provide for his family. And his family went by the wayside while he was gone. Totally destroyed. This is a picture of the Case IH autonomous self-driving tractor being tested in the river bottom land of western Kentucky. This is the future of farming where I can operate a tractor but I don't have to be there. This is farming, but I'm not present. i tell you what, brethren, we ought to take great heed to that. Are we going to be this kind of dad? I'm going to be out doing a job, but I'm not going to be around to do it. Oh, I know I've got a job. I've got to lead my children. I've got to feed them. They need a protector. But, you know, I'm going to be somewhere else just hoping that that happens. Because I'll tell you what, you can't control that 100%. There's no way. It's a machine. Are we going to be that kind of father that we're just going to put it on autopilot and hope for the best? Is that the way we're going to raise our children? I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people that want to lead our children. This is Vladimir Lenin. He's a Russian communist, socialist, Marxist. He looks like a peach, don't he? <laughs> Vladimir Lenin said, give me just one generation of youth and I'll transform the whole world. There's a lot of men like Vladimir Lenin out there that, wants, that are vying for the hearts and the time of our children. He knew what he was talking about. He knew that if he could distract the youth from what they ought to be doing, he says, I can change the whole world. He went on to say, give me four years to teach the children the seed that I've sown will never be uprooted. Four years. How long do children go to high school? Four years. How long do they go to college? They go away from their parents. Four years. He knew what he was talking about. And there are men and women like that that want to get into the minds and the hearts of our children. And they want to put a seed in their hearts and minds that will take them away from God, that will take them to paths that lead to destruction. And they're everywhere. And I'll tell you what, if we're not the vigilant protector, those types of seeds will be sown and our children will leave the fold. I think the statistics about 70% of children that go to college end up leaving the church. Now, I'm not saying that's in our group here, but overall statistics, 70% leave the church after they go to college. Why? Why? Because there are seeds being sown there. And there are seeds that are, there are seeds that are being sown that are, will never be uprooted because we failed to be the protector that we ought to be. You know, here are some priorities that people have for their children. The qualities most parents want for that children, for their children. Responsibility, hard work, helping others, good manners, independence, creativity, empathy for others, tolerance, persistence, curiosity, obedience, and religious faith. These ideas are in descending order. Of all the people polled, Religious faith, religious faith was at the very bottom of the list of things that people wanted for that children. Why is that? Why are they picking on faith? Brethren, we, we set the example. We set the tenor for our children. You know why people are polled and they give that kind of answer? Because that's what's important to them. Because religious faith comes at the bottom of their list and therefore they want to put religious faith at the bottom of the list for their very own children. What about what parents want for their children? Some lofty goals that we have for our offspring. To be happy in life. You want your children to be happy in life? Yeah, sure. What about to lead a healthy lifestyle? Absolutely. What about earn enough money to enjoy a comfortable life? Yeah. To be successful in their career and to fulfill their potential. I think those are all good goals for our children. But I'll tell you what, to me, to be happy in life is far less important 
than to enjoy the joy uh, that comes with being a Christian and the joy in the Lord. That's the kind of happiness, that's the kind of joy that I want for my children. Yes, I want my children to lead a a healthy lifestyle, of course. And I'll tell you what, being a Christian and doing the thing a Christian does will take care of that. They won't be drinking and destroying their liver. They won't be shooting up drugs and destroying their brain. I believe the Christian life, it is a healthy lifestyle. What about make enough money to have a comfortable life? Well, let's, let's just th- talk about that for a second. The love of money is the root of all evil. So why am I all wrapped up in money all of a sudden? And what is a comfortable life? Brethren, we live in a little tiny house on a hillside. We live in a thousand square foot house, and you know what? I kind of like it. And Amy kind of likes it. It's a lot less to clean. You may come to my my house and you may say, how do people live this way? Well, it's not too bad. What is comfort? Where do we want to find comfort at? Do we really find comfort in the money that we make and what it brings to us? Is that the comfort that we want for our children? Or we want them to have safety in the Lord. What we want to have comfort in God's promises. That's where I want to have my children to have their comfort in. What about be successful in their career? You know how much time it could take to be successful in a career? What is success, really? How far do we want our children to go? Do they have to be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies before they're successful? Well, that could take a lot of time, Wayne, couldn't it? Or maybe not so much. I want my children to be successful in the church. I want them to find success there in the provision that they that they have and the responsibility that they have in the church, don't you? That's where I want my children to find success. You know, children spend 17,280 hours roughly from the ages of 5 to 18 preparing for college. In that same amount of time, children spend about 1,782 hours in worship. We spend a lot more time on education than we do in worship, by far. I want my children to have a college education, don't get me wrong. But I'll tell you what, it'll be okay if they don't. If my children can just work, I don't care if they've got a microphone, an ink pen, or a shovel in their hand. As long as they work, make a living, pay the bills, feed the kids, that's okay. But I really, really want them to be successful in the church. What is fulfilling our potential? What is being all that we can be? Brethren, I believe that is summed up in this, is what we can fulfill our potential by taking the talents that God has given our children and teaching them how to use them the best of our ability. That's the potential that I want for my children, don't you? You know, I want to tell you a short story about a failed father. Sad story, really. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27, the Bible says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear into the house of thy father? When, when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house, and did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people." He calls him out. He says, you become fat. Just before this, I won't read the whole story, but he was talking about uh, Eli's sons and how they would dip their fork in, uh, into, the, into the pot or the cauldron there to dip up what was supposed to go to their to, to priest. And it was a lot more and said that if they didn't get what they want, they would take it by force. Kind of like me at a buffet line, right, Wayne? They weren't fulfilling what God had for them. They said, God gave me this. I want to take more. I want more. He goes on, And this shall be a sign to thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is mine in the heart and in uh, in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. He said, You're going to go uh, go from being the guy that's going to dip his fork way down deep into the offering to the guy that's going to be begging for a piece of bread. And you know what that happened? First Samuel chapter four verse seventeen. 
And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck break, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. I want to tell you something that really stood out to me about the story of Eli. You know, we read there before that he called him fat. Now he's dead, and we're going to call him heavy. What are y'all laughing at? You know, his sons had a problem with satisfying their own flesh. Where'd they learn that? They got it from their daddy. He was fat, he was heavy. They had watched their daddy partake of the offering, they saw how fat that he was getting, that he was getting all that he wanted, and he had two sons that grew up to be just like him. And you know what? Those sons died because they learned of that transgression from their father. What's a priest doing sitting down in a chair? Don't he have things to do? Is he asleep at the wheel? I'll tell you what, brethren, though they were in the temple and though they looked like holiness being priests, brethren, attendance is not holiness. I can fool a lot of people by showing up, can I? We become Emmy-winning actors at times, don't we? The show that we perform. Oh, I look like I'm holy, but there's nothing holy about it. I'll tell you what, brethren, shame on us if we let our children grow up and to have this kind of testimony Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, for many, uh, for many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Listen to this. God help us if this is the testimony of the children that we raise, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Eli was a man of God, and he took terrible care of his children, and he showed them what it was like that their God be their belly. They learned that from their daddy. Brethren, we are in a world that it's all about me. It's about all that I can get and not what I can give as the kingdom and the scripture teaches us. It's about what I can give back. I want to be a servant of God, not to be served all the time. My job is to serve, but the world will tell you that's not the case. Just take everything you can get. You know what? You need to have a great career so you can have all the money you can get. You need to have success that you can get all the honor that you can get. I tell you, that is a generation, brethren, whose God is their belly, and it says they mind earthly things, and their end is destruction. God help us if we're leading our children by example down that path, and we're not giving them the tools to succeed and to live a spiritually and godly life, and that let them get out of the bounds of our watch, brethren. I want to tell you, I want to lead by example. I want to be the father that God's called to me, the father... Uh, the importance of the fathers and what happens was explained to us well earlier. I want to be the type of man that my son will look at and say, I want to be like my daddy. I want to be that man. I want to be the type of father that my father was to me. I want to be the kind of example that he was. I want to be faithful like he was and that I saw him practice in our home. I want my daughter to look at me and say, that's the kind of man I want to marry. If you don't look like my daddy, you don't have the time of day. That's what I want for my children. Elders lead their flocks and they have these, these standards that we read about earlier. That they're an example. I want to be that example. I want to feed my children spiritually. You know, there's a lot of people. They, they provide for their children. You know, they, they give them everything they want. They buy them the clothes they want. They buy them the toys they want. Brethren, if we do all that, we can buy our children when they turn 16 a vehicle. We can buy them a college education when they get to that time in life. We can pay the down payment on their first house. But brethren, if that's all we have provided, brethren, we are no provider. You've given your family a bunch of junk. Stuff that are going to rust, 
stuff that's not eternal, that's not going to stick around. Brethren, let's feed our children something. Let's give them something that lasts. Let's show them the way to salvation. Let's show them how to serve God. Let's give them those tools that they need to have the best life that they can have, not only in this world, but in the one to come. How about we give our children that? How about we have a personal responsibility to protect our children? Nobody can do it like I can because they're my children. I'll tell you what, the devil wants to come in. He wants to take our children. I will tell that devil, you can't have my children. These children are made in the image of God. These children have a purpose. And devil, you're going to have to get through me to get my children. They're valuable. They're mine. They were given to me by God. And I'll be if you try to come in and take them. These children belong to the Lord. And how about we keep our priorities in order? Let's quit playing games. Games. Let's get the ball bat out of our kids' hand. Let's put a Bible in it. People spend a lot of time at games. What's that doing for our children? Well, sports builds character. You know what? Christianity builds character too. Nobody's going to get to heaven's gate and God's going to say, what was your on-base percentage? How, how many touchdowns did you score senior year? Brethren, let's do what's important. Let's not lose sight of what we're trying to do here. Let's not just have fun. Let's have fulfillment. Let's give our children that. God bless you. I thank you for your time.